Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Joe Killinger. I've been a real estate entrepreneur for over 20 years and I use this platform to bring on guests and really walk you through tips and tricks to be a successful real estate investor or a real estate agent. Now today we're gonna to focus on real estate investors and how to get started on the residential side with flipping homes. My guest is Jaron Tustar. Jaron is also known as a finance cowboy and he has a good following on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, so make sure you check it out. But he really walks us through how he got started, his vision when he started, how he built everything up, and he owns 20-some properties now, including a couple Airbnbs. We even touch on, should you still be investing in Airbnb? So make sure you check out the video, give us a like we're there, and if you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe. Uh, well, Justin, thank you for coming on the show today. So now you got started. You focus mostly on residential real estate right now, correct? Correct. All right. And how big of a portfolio do you have? So I have uh, 21 homes now. I had 22, just sold one. So I'm down to down to 21 properties. Okay. And they're all, were they originally fix and flip or are you a buy and hold and retiring with these? Yeah, that's the plan. So when I started, when I set out, uh, it was, and it still is to this day with the long-term mindset, I, right. I started building the foundation of long-term rentals, um, you know, in those C, the B class neighborhoods uh, right. where I could cash flow, but, you know, also really looking for the long-term where a tenant's paying off my debt while appreciation's taking place and then right. you know, eventually have them paid off or either trade out the equity to, to level up. Okay. What is your, uh, you're in South Carolina area. What is the average appreciation in the area? There? I would say in general, it's probably, you know, three to 5%. You know, recently it's been, Good. it's been insane. Yeah. And I think it's, so it's, it's been diluted big time in the last, sure. you know, since COVID, which a lot of places have been. Sure. Uh, one thing we have going for us is a lot of people are moving here. So we have a very high growth rate. A lot of people are moving to the Southeast. And I, li I live near a, I don't want to call it a big city, but a, a very fast growing area called Greenville, South Carolina. It's right in the middle of Atlanta and Charlotte. Okay. And so we have a lot of people coming in. So our appreciation is through the roof right now. We have a lot of cash buyers who are moving from, you know, the West Coast or Northeast where homes have generally been higher. So when they sell, you know, they have a decent amount of equity to come down here and just, you know, buy, right. buy in cash and get more bang for their buck. So sure. it's a really good market, um, you know, as far as, you know, buying rentals and then appreciation over time. That's got to be tough for you. How are you getting your hands on these? With those people coming into the community, how are you competing with them? Yeah, it was a lot easier to be quite <laughs> honest in 2018, 2019. Yeah. I'll be honest, you could find deals on Zillow uh, pretty much yeah. every day. I'd say the average purchase price of each home I own, and these are not in like, these aren't D class areas. These are, you know, C plus, B minus class for, yeah. um, you know, $75,000 was the average. And I had to probably put anywhere between seven and $10,000 in them to get them, you know, uh, in good condition to be able yeah. to rent. Those same homes are now going for, you know, 125, 130, and people are starting to keep, compete for them. So you got to get a little more creative on how you're finding deals. Now, we we still find them on the MLS. We'll find them listed on Zillow. Um, really? But, you know, through cold calling, um, some, you know, mass marketing and networking, really, I, you know, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. They're like, how do you find so many deals? And I was like, to be honest, I just tell everybody I meet that I'm looking for rental properties. Yeah. And I would say more of my deals have come from somebody saying, hey, I saw this property, you know, it's about to go up for sale or my friend's mom's sister is about to sell her property. And uh, I've really leveraged my network to be able to bring in more deals. Oh yeah, now I'm sure you're, you work in the brokerage community. Are you talking to a lot of banks if there's gonna be any foreclosures? Or are you guys even seeing that? We're Probably. not seeing it right now. Yeah, yeah, we're not. And I'm close with a lot of local lenders. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they've they been conservative, I would say, the last six months, you know, on what they're lending, doing cash out refis. But I've actually talked to a number of them recently. And, and we had a, a partner of mine who was at a large bank in the area's like board meeting a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I think a lot of banks have realized they've been a little too conservative. And the banks around here seem to like, you know, seem to want to get back on board to, to, to feel confident lending and not let the scare tactics of, I guess, you know, yeah. the media and, and, and inflation uh, hold them back. So we're not hearing of a lot of foreclosures. Like I said, we still have people coming in here buying cash, um, you know, nonstop, a lot of people flooding in. So in our little pocket, at least the outlook is bright. Okay. 
Now, I've got a question, and this is a conversation I was having. When you've got a portfolio like that and it comes to insurance, how are you doing? Are you, you putting a blanket on all your properties or are you individually insuring them? I individually insure them. You do? Uh, yep. Through With my insurance partner, I'd say the average cost, excluding my two Airbnbs, my long-term rental is probably 500 bucks a year um, is what it costs me to insure these homes. And then I keep a umbrella insurance policy as well as just a little extra protection over myself because of, you know, the assets that I have. Okay. Now, do you do it that way because that's the cheapest or have you found a portfolio, a way to put the portfolio under one program? To be honest with you, I haven't, I probably haven't shopped it as good as I have. I live in a small town, a yeah, great yeah. buddy of mine owns his agent, his own agency and I trust him. And that's been kind of sure. his, um, you know, MO of what I should do now, you know, should I probably go out and shop a little better possibly, but I haven't up, up until this point. Yeah. I didn't know if maybe because it's been it's become such a big business. I was wondering if there's been an, a company out there that has created that for uh, residential, and I ha I hadn't heard of it. it. It just crossed my mind. So yeah, me either. That's is, a, I don't know. Yeah, it's not a bad idea at all. Yeah, yeah I know on commercial well, there's there's programs where you can put them all all your programs under one umbrella, and then you can buy and sell. You can trade them in and trade them out. Mm -hmm. And we have a, an insurance partner and she does that. And th that works very well for some of our clients, but that's something uh, I didn't do. Now, how do you finance these? Are you out syndicating each one of these or is this all you're, you're doing it on your own? I did most of these on my own. A couple of them I do own with my, one of my best friends. He's a, a business partner of mine. Okay. Um, but even when we're doing them together, most of the time we're going through local banks. So the majority okay. of them are on commercial notes. Uh, I would say when I started out, uh, they were on 20 year amortizations with a five year balloon. Mm -hmm. Since then, one of our uh, close partners, lending partners has come up with a 20 year fixed note uh, for okay. a commercial product. And I really like that. You know, I don't mind the, the balloons, uh, but I mm -hmm. think anytime you can find a way to mitigate risk and it's not really hurting your returns, why not? And so I felt like a 20 year you know, fixed was a good way to go. So we refinanced a lot of properties into that. So a lot of times it's 20% down on a commercial note. Um, we do have a lender and they, you know, they kind of tightened up on this the last couple of years, but when we first started, he didn't mind, a, a lending to us off of the appraised value of homes. Exactly. So if we would find undervalued deals yeah, and it appraised for higher, there has been times where I would get money back at closing when I bought a property. Good. I didn't have to put any money down. It was, oh, it was amazing. And you know, we, kind of partner. <laughs> yeah, he's, he was huge. And like I said, they don't, you know, they're not really flaunting that anymore. Um, okay. it was, it was great because, you know, if you're running low on capital, it was a good way to get in and you got to make sure when you do that, it's kind of like the Burr method, yeah. you know, you really got to make sure that the numbers still make sense. Cause obviously your loan is going to be higher than you, yeah. you know, originally expected, but if the numbers still make sense, it is a great way to, to get in and really crush the ROI game. Yeah. Now on the assets, if I'm new and I'm looking and I mean, I'm sure when you started out, what, what kind of, you, you focus on, uh, B and C areas, and which completely makes sense. Um, what well, the TV just went off? Um, what uh, I got to pay the electrical? You know, they it's not a rolling blackout. I know everybody in California is. Oh, geez, a rolling blackout. Here we go. Oh, Amber's that's awesome, on, folks. Whoops, I got to quit moving now. Uh, what uh, what did you look for? What when you were first starting? What what were you your first property? What were you looking for? My bread and butter, and I'll put this disclaimer. There's nothing wrong with multifamily. I, right. I just, I haven't dove into that. Um, I, I really look for three, two single family homes. Okay. And, um, you know, I three feel bedroom, like- Three bedroom, two bath. Okay. Exactly. Three bedroom, yeah. two bath uh, that I could do, you know, I could add value. So they, you know, they were run down a little bit, not a full gut, but needed a little bit of love that I could buy for, you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, put 10 grand in, and now it's worth $110,000, $120,000 and it's going to cash flow for me. I like, I personally thought that was a strong foundation uh, to build a rental portfolio, especially for a guy going in on his own, who's not syndicating. And I, if, you know, there's argument to this, but I feel like the data I've looked at that single family homes tend to appreciate more over time than multifamily. It kind of rides the wave with the market where multifamily, you know, you can absolutely crush it in multifamily, but it's more based off of what are the returns of that actual property where, you know, the overall market more correlates to single family homes. And, um, you know, that was a strategy I took and, um, you know, it's worked out for me so far. 
Yeah. The um, now, when you say you're adding value, you go in kitchens and bathrooms. You upgraded them. Is that was your focus in the master bedroom. I bet. Exactly. So we'll go in, you know, maybe slap a little paint, uh, pull up some old carpet, either put down old car or new carpet or put down, you know, some type of uh, faux hardwood flooring, right. fix the kitchen up a little bit, make sure all the plumbing's good, clean the bathrooms up. That's exactly right. So we weren't doing full renovations by any means. Now I, yeah. I have flipped a number of homes and that's a totally different world because you yeah. got to, you got to get it ready for the retail buyer. Um, but you learn, um, you don't want to spend too much money. It's a fine line when getting a home ready for a renter, because I like to offer quality homes to people. You know, I don't want people coming in and living in a bad scenario. Like I want them to walk in and feel like, Hey, this is a great place to live. But you also have to realize that you will run into a number of tenants who aren't going to take care of the place like you would. And so it's right. a fine line of making it a good place, clean place to live, but knowing that it's not going to look the same when they leave. Yeah, it's not theirs. You just, I, I don't care what it is. It's just, you're, you don't take, most people don't take as good a care of it if, it's, if they don't own it. Exactly. Um, now, do you, what about landscaping? Do you have a big focus on landscaping? Do you put in sprinkler systems? No, I do not. I, okay. uh, I do not. And I don't uh, pay for that personally. So, the, you know, the only, the only expenses I cover on my properties, not I'm excluding my two Airbnbs, but my long-term rentals are mortgage taxes and insurance. Okay. So the tenant's going to take care of everything else. Now I have gone to properties that I purchased and the yard looks awful. A lot of times I'll throw down, you know, rye grass and have a company come out and trim the bushes up. You know, you got to get it presentable to sure. rent to yeah. market. Uh, but once they're in there, that's their job to take care of. And then obviously I have to go in and clean it up, you know, after okay. they leave. And do you, um, what about parking? Do you focus on carports or if there's a carport, do you turn it into a garage? Or do you go in and completely, do you add garages? You put that kind of money into it? Not for a rental, not okay. for a rental. I mean, obviously I love when there's a garage or even a carport yeah. because I try to look, whenever I'm buying a property, I try to look at the exit strategy too. Now there's a good chance I'll keep a lot of these for, I love the long game. You know, I love mm -hmm. the photo having them paid off. But if you are going to exit them and flip them, you know, if I have a two, two, two bed, two bath, or even a three, two with a carport and I want to go and flip that, well, it's just an easy way to add an additional room. You know, yeah. you can close in a carport or you can close in a garage. Um, so you can add value there. I do like to have either a carport or a garage. And I would say, I think every property I have outside of maybe two offer that, you know, for the tenants. Yeah. I'll tell you, we did one. Um, it was in uh, our, uh, Silver Lake area here in Los Angeles. Terrible little home. And we had to jack it up, put a new foundation because it was, a, I mean, it was from 40s construction here in L.A. Oh, wow so much sand in that foundation we had to go in tear segments of it out put it new new in and go back and redo the whole thing but and we put all this work into it but then we put this wood deck in the back it was huge it was like a 1500 square foot deck and ultimately that deck is what sold that house <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> it was just it was a huge long lot right and people just love being out the people that bought it you know, they love being out back on that patio, on that big patio. And so, you know, you always want to be looking for ways to upgrade. That was just pure luck in our, you know, we didn't, that wasn't by design. That was just pure luck that we found. Yeah, somebody. but it worked. Yeah, it, it worked. worked well. Uh, the, had that deck. So you always want to be looking for ways to add value that can really enhance the opportunity. Now, if you're focused on renting, I don't know if spending that kind of money on a deck, uh, it just worked for well for us with uh, the sales. So yeah. now how far, now do you self-manage these? I do not. No, I am. Okay. Uh, I'm smarter than that. No, I'm joking. There's a lot of people who do and they do a great yeah. job. Well, 20 uh, some properties. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm not I don't want to be a property manager. I have a full time job. I have a wife. I have three kids. I am involved in a lot of different things. And so for me, right. running around to collect rent and deal with issues yeah, yeah. is not my forte. Yeah. Or, or kitchen sinks and, yeah. um, you know, that kind of stuff that are backed up. Um, matter of fact, let's let's speak to that now. When you're doing uh, C and B areas and all the fixtures that you put in, you know I've gone into some here in LA and they're they're in B areas and C areas, but they put, went to Lowe's and got these higher end appliance or not appliances but fixtures and put them in, and it seems like you know the money they spent probably isn't going to get a return on that. And they were newer. And so, you know, they're, this is their first couple of flips and they were just a couple of blocks apart. And I'm like, man, what they spent on that is not conducive with the home that it was in. Do you see that much back there? Yeah. And are you talking about specifically with rentals? 
Yeah. Like flipping. Yeah. Yeah. I made that mistake. My first property I ever bought um, <laughs> or second property I ever bought. Yeah. I went in and, uh, you know, I made it too nice. And yeah. then you realize I didn't need to do this to get the amount of rent that I could have got without it. Yeah. And so I would encourage you guys who are listening, don't make that mistake. Hear it from, you know, from myself <laughs> and Joe. And like, me. <laughs> Yeah, you don't you don't you don't need to do that if you're gonna rent it. Don't go spend yeah. a bunch of money on nice stuff. It's gonna get messed up and it's it just doesn't really blend with the house. I'll tell you, I used to um my wife and I, I guess we thought we were chipping Joanna Gaines for a little bit when we first started. So we wanted yeah. to be real involved with the updates, even when it was a rental. And I got to the point now, my property management, they handle it all. So like yeah. even when a tenant leaves or I buy a new home and I need to get it fixed, I give them a budget and let them knock it out. Yeah. When you bring some emotion to it, it's it's what Chip and Joanna Gaines do is pretty amazing. But you know, actually, if you've bitten it, you should go to Waco and see what they've done down there. Yeah, I have. It's cool. Oh, yeah. It's my awesome. sister, I was, it was, I think it was last July. And my sister wanted, she loves that show. And my niece, love that place or love the show. So I had to go down. I was dreading it. I'm like, oh my God. I am going to go down in Texas heat. And we have a corporate condo in Dallas. So it's, it's a pretty easy trip to have a couple hours mm -hmm. drive down. But I was amazed. What those yes. people have done is absolutely amazing. And the jobs they're creating in Waco, but um, pretty amazing. I actually is. enjoyed it more than my, my family did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. It's impressive. Oh, the branding is, everything's just on point. It's everything yeah. is so well thought out. Um, yeah. Absolutely loved it. But um, all right, I'm getting off track. But I think the key thing, Justin, is assessing the value. How do you know you're paying the right price for a multifamily property? Great question. You know, yeah. How do we do that? How do you do yeah. that? Yeah, I think it, everything takes practice, um, you know, and you're not going to feel confident the first couple of times, but as simple as, as it sounds, I literally, whether it's, I have my real estate license, disclaimer, you do not have to have your license to invest. Um, I didn't buy mine until years after I started investing, but I simply will get on either PropStream, which is an app I use or Zillow. And I will look at what's sold in the area. I mean, it's really that simple and looking at comps. And so if you can look at what's recently been sold, see how many beds, how many baths, square foot, what type of condition it's in, then you can go and compare those, um, you know, how, how nice that property is, the size of that property to the property you're looking at. And, you know, you just, you compare to how nice is my master bath to there? Do I have a garage? Do they have a garage? Am I 1300 square foot? Cause they're 1300 square foot. And you can get a really good idea of what your property is worth that way. And then I would also for all beginners recommend partnering with an agent uh, when you're starting. And even as you go along, somebody who is used to working with um, investors, because they're going to be able to pull those comps for you even easier. I think it's a good exercise for you to try to run comps yourself yep. uh, because it's going to teach you, but bring the professional in before you ever take the dive of actually purchasing. And um, you'll be, you'll be a okay at that point. Yeah. It's, I can tell you now as many properties as, as we bought and I still double and triple check before we pull a trigger, we just bought yes. a, uh, a, a Jack in the box in Allen, Texas. And before we pulled the trigger, I mean, we just sat down and go over the numbers and look where we could have made a mistake. And it's just, it's so key to check and double check those numbers. But yeah, now um, you've got your real estate license. Are you, what about contractors? When you do your inspections, who do you use? So I got a local inspector that I use for all my properties. And for every property I buy, I do a home inspection and a termite inspection. Yep. Uh, for some reason, they do them separate here. I think in some places, you know, a home inspector will do Here too. We'll do yeah. both, but those are two that I do not skip out on every time. Um, and I want to know because a lot of negotiation happens before you get a property under contract, but sure. sure. But it, I think an even stronger negotiation happens after a property is under contract and you've got your inspection reports back because now you can go back to that seller and beat them up on issues that you found to get a better price than maybe you agreed to originally. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to really in that. So many stories about that roof. <laughs> you know, you yes. got to make sure, especially when we're in Texas, when we were buying multifamily in Texas, they get a little hail every once in a while and yep. the heat just wears it out. So you want to make sure you check the roof and all the systems. Yep. Um, how many deals a year are you guys doing right now? Are you just, do you have a plan set for, I want to do X mm -hmm. amount of properties this year, or do you just wait until the deal comes along that you, you want? 
You know, when I first started um, in 2018, I had a goal to reach 25 properties by the time I was 30. I'm 30 now, I got a 22. So I didn't quite hit where I was wanting to go. Um, so that was like, that was kind of my sprint goal. I was really, really focused on real estate and growing that portfolio um, as much as I possibly could through those long-term rentals. Since then, um, you know, as of this year, I, I'm dabbling in some other endeavors as well. So, you, you know, you get opportunities, the more, the more they, you know, they say the, the rich get richer. I'm not rich by any means, but you realize as you start accumulating wealth, it's interesting how different opportunities come. And so you yep. got to balance, you know, you know, should I spend some of my money here? What's this ROI going to be compared to real estate? So I'm not buying quite as much this year as I have in the past, but I am actively looking at all times. And so I'm, I'm being very picky right now. Um, you know, and what I, I, what I buy, I still like to try and buy great deals. And I was running into a lot more great deals a few years ago where it's a little tougher to come by the great ones now. Um, but I would say, and this isn't a set number, I, I am pushing to, to buy two to three every year. That's my goal for this year. Okay. And, um, you know, sometimes it, and that's long-term rentals. But, you know, like I was doing that same thing last year. I was looking about two or three long-term rentals while I came across a great Airbnb. It cost more money. It cost what three, you know, two or three long-term rentals would have cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of knocked that bird out with one property with Airbnb because the ROI was that much sure. better. So, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. Now, did you, now I know you've been in finance for a long time, but did you have a business plan when you started or you just start going, blowing and going? And then I started blowing and going. I uh, luckily I had, um, yeah, it's just like at some point you just got to get started. You can, yeah. you can sit around and ponder it all you want, but yep. you got to take the jump. And I was lucky enough, my best friend got into real estate right out of college and um, he got hooked up with a great guy. They now manage a large fund and they syndicate deals and they're absolutely okay. crushing it. But when they were on the smaller scale, they were still buying single family homes and he kept pushing me and pushing me. And I was seeing what it was doing for him. You know, I was seeing the, the wealth that he was creating and, um, you know, finally he brought me a property in Greenville, South Carolina is the first one I bought. And he like, didn't give me a choice. Essentially. He's like, you're buying this property. You're getting started. I was so scared. And you guys watching this, if you haven't bought one yet, I know how you feel right now. You're like, what? You don't know what's on the other side. And, and there, it's, there's so much fear. You know, you think about everything that could go wrong and fear, fear can be good uh, as long as we harness it correctly, but we got to take a step back. I always, you know, tell the folks who, who talk to me about real estate, you got to take a step back and get out of the emotions for a second. Yeah. And like, let's get back to logic. And I think the risk of not buying real estate is greater than the risk of buying real estate because you're going to miss out on generational wealth by sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. You know, we see in Santa Monica where I, where I live here in California is we've got a lot of people have been renting for 30, 40 years and you sit and talk to them. I'm like, you know, their rent is cheap because they've been living there. We have rent control, but I'm like, have you realized, have you done the math? If you would have bought a house 30 years ago where you'd be right now, yeah. 20 years ago, you know, 10 years ago, where yeah. would you be right now? And, you know, some people really understand it. Some of them don't really care. They just want to have, and I get, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there. Grant Cardone says, don't buy a house. It's the worst thing you can ever do. But, yeah. You know, he, he, as he's buying all these. Yeah. I had to disagree with him on that one. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I do too, especially here in areas where you're getting appreciation, like you guys are getting. It's, yeah. It's easy money and you're, you're living. Plus the yep. write off. But um, there's a few things that Grant and I don't see eye to eye on, but that's just one of them. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's a great place to put your money. Now, I do have a question. You said, how many uh, Airbnbs do you have? I have two Airbnbs. Okay. Are they in tourist driven areas or are they around lakes? What are they around? They are in a vacation destination. So they're okay. in Charleston County, Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. Uh, they're on a gated, it's a private island, a gated community called Seabrook Island. So it's right okay. next to Kiowa, just south of Charleston. And a lot of people vacation there. How'd you, how'd you convince your wife that you weren't going to live there? <laughs> I know. I, she would live in Charleston. I would say the only way is my parents live up here and we have three boys. So. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, you got to clamp down. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're tied down. We got the help up uh, here. So. All right. Well, what do you think? You know, we do we do this podcast uh, or videos quite often. And I talk to a lot of people doing Airbnbs around the country. And some of them have just, you know, they bought in, 
you know, if it's not a tourist driven area or along the coast, do you think we're going to see some of those coming on the market now? Because with gas prices, with food prices, do you think peop- tourism is going to stay? Or what do you think is going to happen with a lot of those Airbnbs? That's a, that's a good question. I was actually thinking about this the other day, and I don't know the answer. I wish... Okay. I wish I had. Here's my speculation. I think you're right on the um, the homes that aren't in the destination, like vacation spots. Yep. Uh, I think they'll take a little more of a hit. Now, the beautiful thing about them, if they bought them right, they could turn them into long term rentals. But the problem is a lot of people will buy those types of home based on the Airbnb income and long term rental income is nowhere near Airbnb income. Mm-hmm. So we may see a little bit of struggle there in the, in the coming years if, you know, inflation keeps rising, gas prices, the cost of travel keeps going up. As far as homes that are in de- destination areas, I still think even during tough times, I mean, yeah, travel is going to shrink, but I still feel like people want to get away and go on vacation. So you might see a slowdown maybe on the in the off season, you know, where people are coming in for three, four nights. But your summer months, like for me on a, on a beach and I bought in like a very high dollar area, like, you know, you know, good clientele. I don't foresee myself taking a big hit even over the next couple of years, especially in the summer. You look from Memorial Day to Labor Day. I feel pretty confident that we'll be OK there. Yeah. Yeah. I think I really go ahead. sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying I really like Airbnb areas for anybody who's into the Airbnb game. And I don't consider myself an expert at it by any means. But I think just common sense tells you you want to buy in those areas that people have been traveling to for a long time for mm-hmm. vacation, for tourist purposes. And I really like the areas where they've already got the regulations ironed out and they've been allowing long or short term rentals for years you know, they're friendly to them. They're going to continue being friendly to them. And I think if you do that, you set yourself up for long-term success. Yeah, I think so too. If you really come at it from, you know, you always want to have an exit strategy, right? So Airbnb is great, but let's say something happens and new restrictions get put in or, you know, gas prices go to, I think I paid six seventy nine a gallon. Yeah. <laughs> Eighteen, uh, $19 to fill my motorcycle. Damn, That's that fellow. crazy. Yeah, I've never paid. Anyway, uh, yeah, it uh, you've got to have a, a, a backup. So, you know, I think it, it's key to really, if you're going to be a really solid investor, make sure you're doing your due diligence. And, you know, there's a post I put out yesterday, the Census Bureau, and looking where population is going. And I think that's key, too. You want to make sure mm-hmm. that, you know, look where the population is going and have that as a target as well. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And that's why I love our market especially for, uh, you know, the long-term rental market is so good. You know, a lot of people buy in the Midwest and there's, I think the Midwest is fine. Like you can find great deals, but I think you can find really, really good deals there because a lot of people may be moving a little farther South. (laughs) Not that uh, rentals are going to die in the Midwest by any means, not saying that, but um, you know, I like to mix in a little. I mean, coming from Nebraska, that's where I'm originally from. And you spend a winter there and see how you feel. Mm-hmm. You know, spend a winter with your family there. <laughs> you know, yeah. No, I love my exactly family. Right. If you're watching it, I was joking, but you're going to get me in trouble, Justin. <laughs> the in-laws. Uh, <laughs> the in-laws. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it's uh, it's great. But, you know, I, I do think that there is going to be some opportunity. There's some Airbnbs that were probably purchased where, you know, maybe they're, they're not going to see the cash flow. There might be in some of these areas that are not tourist driven or on the coast might be some opportunity to go out and buy those. So yeah. it might be something as a, an investor, everybody wants to focus on, but well, Justin, do you have any final tips for us? My final tip would be, and I didn't dive into this as much as I should when you asked me is, is know your numbers and keep emotion out of the, out of the picture. You know, I talked about running comps to know the value of the home you're buying, but there's a lot more that goes into it. You need to know every expense before you think about pulling the trigger. You know, you need to know, what your mortgage is, your terms is, your interest rate, insurance, taxes. Do you have an HOA? Do you have landscaping? You know, what's your property management fee going to be? You know, do you have to cover cable and water and septic? You need to know all of that. And you need to be honest with yourself when you are plugging those numbers in to spit out, okay, what is your cash flow going to be? What is your NOI, your cap rate, your cash on cash return? And trust those numbers. Uh, Don't you know, when, when I was new to it, and I still do it sometimes when I really want a property, if a property is not making sense, if the numbers aren't making sense, don't manipulate them to be best case scenario to make the property make sense. Just push it to the side yep. and say, hey, that's not it. Or find what purchase price does make sense and offer that and say, this is as, this is as low, you know, as high as I can offer. 
and give, give a reason for that when you make an offer. Say, hey, here's why I'm offering this amount because when I run my numbers, I have to be able to make a little bit of income and this is where it has to be. And if they take it, great, move forward. If not, go on to the next property. So that would be my encouragement is make sure that you know your numbers before you dive in on a property. That's, yeah, no, patience, right? Patience is, you just need to know that very well. But all right, Jaron, so tell us, uh, you're, you're on TikTok under Finance Cowboy, right? TikTok is uh, the finance cowboy. The finance cowboy. YouTube. Somebody had already stole finance cowboy. YouTube oh. is just finance cowboy and Instagram is just finance cowboy. All right. That's what it is. So, and I'm going to put those links down below. Okay. So everybody can reach out to you. And Jaron, thank you for coming on the show today. It's a great, uh, that's some great information for our subscribers. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate you having me. You bet. And for those of you watching, make sure you check out the video. Give us a like and if you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe.